Good morning. My name is Emma Reynolds. I'm the Managing Director of Public Affairs Policy and Research here at the City UK. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the launch of the City UK's report, Crypto Assets, Shaping UK Regulation for Innovation and Global Leadership. I'm here to welcome you and say a few words of introduction. Then the report's author, Kate Rhodes, uh, will present the main objectives and recommendations of the report before handing over to the City AM's managing editor, Andy Sylvester, who will chair a distinguished panel of experts, some of whom have contributed to the report to discuss the report and its broader policy issues. And thanks again to Andy and our panelists for doing so. Today's publication is very timely. Crypto assets, digital currencies and distributed ledger technology, DLT, have made the headlines in recent days, weeks and months. It is also timely given the fast and impressive growth of the UK's fintech, innovation and payments landscape, and indeed the growing interest of both institutions and consumers in crypto assets. I would like to thank all of the City UK members who have contributed to this report and helped to shape its thinking. Early this, this year, the City UK responded to the Treasury's crypto asset consultation on the UK regulatory approach to crypto assets and stable coins. And we've also consulted with the Treasury, the Financial Conduct Authority, Payment Systems Regulator and the Bank of England on our work. We have built on that consultation response by writing this report, which has two audiences in mind. On the one hand, policymakers and those with an expertise in this area, and on the other hand, those uh, members and external stakeholders who are perhaps less familiar with the subject to allow you to navigate the sometimes confusing world of crypto assets. The pandemic has had an impact on this debate too. It has accelerated the digitization of payments and services and the use of alternatives to cash. And one of these areas where there has been a huge surge is the uptake of crypto assets. Crypto assets and their underlying distributor distributed ledger technology or DLT can be used in a wide range of industries, such as financial services, healthcare, retail and property. It is mostly in financial services where this technology has received the most attention, with many firms now looking for ways to make crypto assets and DLT part of their technology infrastructure. However, any type of regulatory uncertainty has been a barrier to entry to technology based solutions becoming mainstream and therefore we believe that the UK should seize the opportunity to shape the regulation of these assets at a national and international level. We welcome the Bank of England's recent announcement that it will be considering its approach to central bank currencies and their intention to establish technical and stakeholder engagement forums. Several other countries, including Sweden, France, Japan and Switzerland, are also currently testing central bank digital currencies with a view to issuing them into public circulation. Industries beyond financial services are also thinking about the ways these technologies will impact them and how best to deploy them. And as more industries do so, there will be more applications, products and services, and this in turn will open potential new markets for financial and professional services firms. The financial inclusion aspect of these technologies is interesting and relevant, and it's crucial that customers are protected and well informed. As these new technologies become more consumer friendly and regulated, it's likely that more businesses and individuals will begin to adopt them. The current lack of established and consistent regulation of crypto assets is one of the main regulatory challenges and opportunities that we hope that this report will provide policy recommendations that will meet that challenge and enable us to make the best of the opportunities in this new exciting and cutting edge policy area. This report echoes one of the key recommendations of the Khalifa Review that the UK should set the gold standard for the regulation of crypto assets. And I would like to thank again all of our members who have been involved in the shaping of this report and a particular thanks to Clifford Chance, Freshfields, Linklaters, Santander UK and Standard Chartered Bank. I would also like to again to thank Andy Sylvester of the City AM for chairing the panel and our panellists, Diego, Karen, Matthew and Stephen. Before we move to the panel discussion, I will hand over to Kate Rhodes, the author of this report, and who has led the UK, City UK's special working group in crypto assets and DLT uh, to present its main findings. Kate, over to you. Thanks, Emma. And thank you to all the TC UK members who've been involved in the crypto asset working group to date, along with the panel today. 
This report is set in the context of many developments in the UK's tech and innovation landscape, especially after the recommendations of the Khalifa Review, the Bank of England's recent CBDC announcement, as well as the recent press attention given to the latest crypto dip and announcement from Elon Musk. The UK has had a long commitment to innovation within financial services, and this has always been supported by a forward-looking regulator. It now has a valuable opportunity to shape the approach to crypto assets and DLT at a global level that supports the competitiveness of the UK in the, in, uh, in the UK's financial and professional related services ecosystem. Our report provides several recommendations in relation to the regulation of crypto assets, as well as an overview of token taxonomies and policy issues. And our report specifically uses the term crypto asset rather than cryptocurrency, because there is a clear distinction between the two. Cryptocurrencies are a type of crypto asset, but not all crypto assets are cryptocurrencies. This dis distinction is important, and a lot of thinking around crypto assets in the City UK report reflects this point. As echoed in the Khalifa review, the UK has been encouraged to have a strong position in this space and made extra efforts to become a leading global hub for authorised crypto activity. <clears throat> Our report also states, like the review, the UK needs to act quickly in order to set the golden standard for regulation of this area in order to maintain its position at the forefront of innovation and technology. We're now seeing increased participation of crypto assets from an institutional perspective and at a national level. Equally, there is a marked interest from retail investors. Consumer protection is another key issue of this matrix of considerations when regulating crypto assets and transparency on the part of service providers will be important. Recognizing that there are multiple categories as users and user cases will be key because these considerations avoid disproportionate regulation and regulatory arbitrage. We recommend an outcomes-based approach to regulation that is also no pr proportionate and risk-based. Legislators and regulators are recognizing crypto assets do not always fit into the right parameters of existing regulation. All tokens are designed to do different things and work in different ways, including the rights they provide and their economic uses and impacts. We propose that, the, that any extension of the regulatory perimeter should be based on the granular characteristics and taxonomies of tokens and identification of unregulated risks, which require clear definitions. Some deployments of DLT can give rise to new forms of financial products and services which may be suitable for regulation. Others may provide an alternative delivery mechanism for existing projects without posing new risks, so do not need changes in the regulatory treatment. Our report suggests that any future regime needs to adapt a functional and technology neutral approach with flexibility in order to address future challenges. Starting with the G7 presidency this year, the UK has a unique opportunity to build consensus around what needs to be done to avoid fragmentation of approach. Cross-border alignment will be key, so firms can meet high regulatory standards without conflicts of law. The time is now. The corrode approach to regulation will be huge in positioning the UK at the forefront of innovation at a global level. And now I'm going to hand over to Andy Sylvester, Managing Editor of City AM, who's kindly agreed to chair the panel today. City AM is one of the few UK daily news feeds with a dedicated crypto section, so hopefully this panel will provide much food for thought. Andy, over to you. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, Emma, for that uh, introduction, um, a rather fulsome introduction, certainly, to the report, and, and Emma for laying out why this is certainly a timely topic. Um, and I don't just mean, of course, because, as you alluded to, the recent crypto dip and the extreme volatility we've seen over recent uh, recent weeks. I was thinking about this uh, event as I was watching The Big Short over the weekend, uh, the Steve Carell movie from uh, sort of traces the global financial crash. And there's this wonderful event in which Mark Baum, who had shorted essentially the entire American housing market, and Bruce Miller, very much a, a bull on Wall Street, were having a panel discussion about the future of Wall Street and whether or not there was a crash coming, et cetera, et cetera. And during the event, uh, gradually people leave as news pings onto Blackberries of Bear Stearns's imminent collapse. And I was thinking, I hope Elon Musk doesn't tweet during this event or any of you with cryptocurrencies are all gonna to have to bail off immediately and work out whether or not you need to buy or sell. Um, 
but it's a timely discussion for other reasons because as has been alluded to Khalifa review amongst other things this is a real opportunity for the UK and you know being completely frank about my journey as a business journalist or whatever I've gone from hard skeptic to being gently intrigued to being relatively convinced that this is going to be a key part if we get it right of London's continued competitiveness and that's never been more important than when some of the things that the City of London in particular has relied upon for so many years be it clearing or trading executions are obviously going to be affected by our departure from the European Union so it's a really exciting time and a very timely discussion and certainly a timely report and credit to the City UK too for weighing in on a debate and coming you know, these institutional organisations that have been around for a while and talking about interesting things in finance for a while, really getting stuck into this topic um, and hoping to make the UK a world leader. Um, to those of you uh, listening, watching, whichever, um, you'll be able to submit questions when we get to the end of this panel discussion. You can just pop them in the Q&A, which you should be able to find somewhere if you sort of wave your cursor over the Zoom screen. And I'll ask a few questions of the panelists as we get towards the end. Now, without further ado, we've got a wonderful panel and they're far more interesting than I am on this topic. Um, we've got Diego Ballon, Dr. Karen Larez, Matthew Gravel and Stephen Cock. I'll introduce them properly in person and we'll start with Diego. Diego is a senior associate in financial regulatory services at Clifford Chance here in the capital, specializes in advising financial institutions and other market participants on financial market regulation, activities related to crypto assets, digital asset trading, and a whole host of other things. He's gained significant experience working right across the UK's sort of financial landscape, including at the FCA um, and its predecessor revision, and ranked as a rising star for financial services by Legal 500. Diego, good to have you here. Um, let's start on regulation, I suppose. What is the main issue around regulating crypto assets and why are they so hard to regulate from perspective of, of users in particular? What do you see as the crypto regulatory changes for firms? Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> I think, I mean, there is a very short answer. It's so hard to regulate them because they're new um, and that brings challenges. And if we start unpicking that a little bit, there are a few things that are new. The, the first thing is the tech is new in, in the sense that it's only, what, 10 years old. And I think regulators are sort of only now getting to grips with what the tech does and how it actually works. So that's sort of one aspect which makes it harder. The second aspect is that there is such a global reach. It's so easy to invest from you know, from London into any exchange that's situated wherever they may be in the world and they're operated at the same time. And I think the other thing is that the, the massive scale of the sector, it's, it's really growing. There is, there is a constant new token being issued at any given time, you can you can see it. There, there are um, decentralized platforms growing everywhere. There are the, the main centralized platforms that are growing. More asset classes are being being added. Various types of instruments are being created, and so it's just you know the the volume the. The, the scale of it is, is, is very impressive. But what that, does that mean from, from a regulatory perspective? From a regulatory perspective, I think um, the key concern for regulators is as always consumer protection. And what tends to be done immediately is to try and think of an analogy. What do we have today that we're already, or already regulating, which we can use as a blueprint to start applying our rules? And, it, it becomes really tricky when one starts thinking of crypto assets as a, as a single thing. It's a huge mistake to do that because some crypto assets are meant to behave like cash, like money, um, you know, and they're meant to be um, something that you can pay with, a means of exchange. And if you think about it in the real world, you don't regulate money in that way, other than regulating some banking institutions money is largely unregulated. I, I can hold money in my wallet for myself and I can you know pay with it and nobody will apply regulation to me. Um, it starts getting trickier when that money is obviously digitalized and held through providers and you'd want to start applying the rules that you apply to banks to those providers, um, particularly because the ecosystem doesn't quite work. Mm. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got you know investments that typically you, you think of securities, you think of shares, you think of bonds, you think of you know, funds and things that people invest in. And so 
one tries to draw an analogy of the crypto assets in the crypto asset space to, to these asset classes, but it doesn't quite work because they're not exactly the same. They don't give you the same rights. They don't give you, um, you know, the, the ecosystem is different. There are not the same actors there. And so it becomes a real, you know, difficulty to start applying regulation in the same way. And then the third piece, which is quite interesting is that we want this industry to grow. As, as we were saying in the beginning, Kate made the point, this is a huge opportunity. And regulators are really concerned that by applying rules heavy handedly, they're gonna kill the industry. And you know, that is not what we're what we're here for. So I think it's 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 quite timely to have the report trying to make these points, these distinctions. Not all crypto assets are the same. You need to treat them differently. You need to think about what they do. And then, you, you know, you, you will face some practical challenges because where do you draw the line? Which one is an investment? Which one is cash? How do you make that distinction? It, it's all very, very difficult. Um, but I think we can get there. <clears throat> we can get there indeed, I'm sure. You made a really interesting point there about the fact this is, you know, if, it's a really fundamental point, but I think a, a point that we probably need to remember in all these discussions is that, you know, this is incredibly new technology. Right? And it took something like 50 years uh, in the city of New York between the first automobile hitting the streets and a major motor fair. It took about 50 years before somebody came up with the idea of traffic lights. So regulation moves slowly sometimes. But right now, with the digital revolution, that's going to have, have to change, I think. And I moved to um, Dr. Karen Larez. Uh, she's a legal advisor, entrepreneur, lecturer, PhD in financial markets. Well, what she doesn't know probably isn't worth knowing. Um, in 2007, she was the lead legal in-house counsel of Falcon Private Bank, it was the first bank to offer crypto assets to clients. And she later joined MME law firm, specialist crypto law firm. Karen advises banks, startups in crypto and DLT projects. And she's also, interestingly for this discussion, uh, a co-chair of the regulatory working group of the Crypto Valley Association, as well as the author of the Swiss Crypto guide. Um, Karen, I wonder if you could sort of first outline a little bit about the Swiss model of, of you know, regulation around, around cryptocurrencies and, and DLT. Obviously, the DM Association was based in Switzerland, but have now moved their operations to the US. Regulator recently published some guidance on stablecoins. So I guess give us a quick overview of, of that regulatory space, and then what the UK can learn from it. Because the other thing that Diego alluded to is, is the, the locationless nature of of cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and how can the uk then use its regulatory environment to become the global hub for something that fundamentally doesn't really have a location sure yeah i'm more than happy to to talk about it so um switzerland has a technology neutral approach and uh, which means that only if there is a need for a new regulation or legislation the regulator steps in um, just um, currently, or just like recently, actually, this year, the um, lawmakers or, uh, introduced a new law called the DLT framework. It's not one specific law, it's kind of a framework because um, it covers uh, different kind of aspects, uh, such as bankruptcy laws, banking laws, uh, securities laws, and so on. And um, this is really interesting because... Over the time, the regulator um, realized that there are actually loopholes and that we have to have a solid framework to continue with, uh, with the crypto space or with the DLT-based technologies and, and services um, and so on. So what we now have, uh, what, what Switzerland introduced in February uh, this year, is the so-called ledger-based security or DLT securities. It's a new um, type of... Um, of securities which wasn't existent until now so now it's possible to actually tokenize shares or better to issue shares in in the form of a token actually and the second um, um, like innovation uh, so to say is the DLT trading facility uh, which is basically an exchange a crypto exchange but for DLT securities. And it is expected um, that as of uh, August 1st, which is the Swiss National Day, interestingly, um, it's possible to get a, a DLT trading facility license. Um, also, the Swiss um, financial market supervisor, FINMA, has, has a specialized and dedicated FinTech desk 
um, that desk is very approachable and very knowledgeable as well. So there is always room to discuss new ideas and projects and it's very, the, the, the desk is very support, supportive in general. And to come back to your question, uh, what has happened in the past in Switzerland, um, so in 2017, we had this huge ICO boom. Uh, there was a big wave and FINMA, the regulator was really overwhelmed and has, um, has also seen that uh, actually there is need for, for clarity in the space. Uh, that's why in February, 2018, FINMA published the ICO guidelines. And in these guidelines, um, FINMA basically was the first regulator who stepped in and um, introduced the token classification. So the token classification in Switzerland is, uh, we have the, the payment token, we have the asset token and the utility token. The securities token is a subgroup of the asset token in Switzerland. Um, and the guidelines, I have to say, they are and, and, and I mean, they were and still are very helpful for projects and also for lawyers to understand whether a project uh, falls under re the regulatory um, uh, space or not. And um, later then in 2019, uh, FINMA also introduced a supplement or an addition to the ICO, ICO guidelines. Um, and the, the supplement or the addition was on stable coins. And you may know why this was the reason, right? <laughs> so it was because of the, that time it was still called the Libra project, Facebook's Libra project, but now it's called Diem. Um, FINMA, FINMA's approach is, um, or they stated that their, their approach is basically uh, to focus on the economic function and purpose of the tokens. And FINMA also stated that um, projects will be analyzed on a case-by-case -case basis, following the concept basically of same risks and same rules. And um, the, the, the legal and regulatory requirements really depend on the asset backing the token, I mean, the stable coin, and uh, such as, uh, let's say, uh, currencies or commodities or securities basket uh, of securities. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's a really helpful kind of overview. I guess just one quick follow up question before we move to, to Matthew would be, you know, what's the, if there's one takeaway for the UK, or indeed anyone that wants to be a global leader in this, you know, it's not going to be nothing. <laughs> I've made I've made my put my cards on the table. You know what's the what's the one takeaway that anyone looking to be kind of world leading in a space should look at? I think the main takeaway um, is that um, the crypto and blockchain uh, that crypto and blockchain projects have an inter international scope. And the best um, example is really the, the DM project. Uh, um, you mentioned it already. So uh, DM actually wanted to get uh, a license in Switzerland, but now they decided to move uh, to, to the US uh, again or to move to the US actually. So the I think there is really a requirement of an international approach. And I think regulators, um, I think it's really crucial that regulators exchange uh, information and idea um, ideas as well, and that the jurisdictions or the regulators they really really talk to each other. Um, yeah, and as I said, the DM project is one of the, of course, of uh, it's a unique, <laughs> a unique project that is of international, uh, great international interest, uh, with uh, and especially um, with uh, great interest uh, on the part of the United States. But I think for the UK, the main takeaway is, is really don't just focus on on a national level, but really on an international and global level, and uh, have an exchange also with other jurisdictions. For sure, no, that makes perfect sense. Consensus for advancement. I quite like that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Turn out to Matthew Gravel, Director of Group Public and Regulatory Affairs at Stanshot Bank, where he focuses on regulatory change relating to digital assets, data and innovation in the UK and across all of the banks. Markets worked in regulatory policy in the city uh, for just under a decade, policy roles in government as well as think tanks in Canada. Um, describes himself as a lapsed political scientist, so perhaps we'll go back into politics at some point, um, with a PhD from UBC in Vancouver. Matthew, good to have you here. Um, you are regulatory focused, you're aware of this kind of space. Let's, let's speak about central banks for a period. So what 
when you see, you know, the opportunities and challenges there, and again, you know, this has become a bit of a discussion about a global race, you know, which jurisdictions are making what you would see as the most headway and, you know, in a broader sense, you know, top level sense, what does that do to the wider concept of, of central bank money? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Andy. We, when we were working on this report with, um, with the city UK, I think we were keen to get CBDC, central bank digital currencies included in the report. Um, which isn't maybe an obvious thing to do because they're, they're not fundamental or certainly not necessarily crypto assets. Many central banks in thinking about how to issue a digital currency have been quite clear. I think the ECB had a consultation out at one point with a headline that said uh, a CBDC is not a crypto asset, just in case there was any confusion about the, sort of the, the political and regulatory status of these things. Um, so we're not necessarily talking about crypto, but at the same time, I think CBDCs and and, and digital currencies more generally have become part of the same conversation in terms of the future of money uh, and in terms of some of, the, some of the policy challenges that both private and public digital innovations related to payments and money are trying to solve. Um, so that's why we wanted CBDCs kind of included in the conversation, even though we, we obviously recognize that, that, that they're not necessarily even gonna be based on cryptographic technology, uh, much less crypto assets. Um, in the narrative that we're starting to see emerge in some of the popular press, and Andy, I'm not going to point the finger, the finger at you necessarily, but there's, there's often a sort of uh, crypto or CBDCs narrative taking shape, that this is really kind of a public sector response to a threat from the private sector, a threat from, from decentralized, privately issued or, or, or mined uh, forms of currency. We don't necessarily see it that way uh, on our side. I mean, I think public and private forms of money have always coexisted. The fact that they're digital doesn't mean they can't coexist in the future. Uh, this is obviously going to be a policy and regulatory challenge to, 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 to solve to make sure that, for example, something that's based on cryptographic technology and privately issued is suitable to be used as money. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a regulatory question we're all wrestling with right now. Indeed, HMT's proposal went a long way to, to proposing some solutions there. Um, how, you know, what protections do you need? How do you replicate confidence in existing that you have an existing private money for, for new forms of, of private money? Um, and to what extent does the, the public sector need to or decide to play a role in also issuing a public sector alternative to these private forms of money? So, so I think there really is room for coexistence here. And indeed, some of the, the exciting use cases that we see would really, uh, would really see both public and private forms of digital money coexisting on the same platforms. Um, so there's real opportunity. As I mentioned off the top, we think some, you know, that, that CBDCs can improve financial inclusion, they can uh, improve in cho uh, choice for consumers. Um, they can solve cross-border inefficiencies when it comes to payments. A lot of the things, frankly, that, that, that private stable coins are also designed to issue. So those policy drivers are maybe common across the public and, and, and private, uh, private sphere. Uh, but we also see some risks and issues that you need to deal with here. I mean, as, as a commercial bank, I think one of the things that we're wondering about is what does the issuance and protect, uh, potential direct issuance of central bank money to consumers mean for intermediated markets, credit markets, et cetera? Uh, what does it do to the existing commercial bank model and frankly, even fractional reserve banking, uh, which is sort of at the core of so many of our economies? Um, so how do you move to a system based on central bank digital currencies um, that uh, both continues to make room for commercial bank money, other privately issued money? Uh, how do you transition to that? How do you design it to avoid disintermediating commercial banks um, these are the kinds of issues that, you know, we're looking forward to working with, with authorities on. And, um, and off the top, it was mentioned that the UK has launched new task forces and engagement forums. I think that's exactly the right model. Obviously, the US has just announced uh, the Fed chair that they're going to be moving forward with some, some work this summer uh, around looking at a digital dollar, we're waiting to see next steps from the ECB and other markets are, are, are way out of the gate, including China. Um, so that sort of engagement with policymakers to make sure we transition to something that makes sense for both uh, the existing kind of intermediary layer uh, as well as central banks that are trying to solve some of the same challenges that we all see in, in, in payments, um, I think is going to be really key. And then maybe just the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll raise, and this kind of ties it back off to what I said at the top about uh, CBDCs not being crypto, is I, how do you actually regulate a CBDC? What's the regulatory treatment of a CBDC? Because just saying it's fiat and issued by a central bank is fine, uh, but are there actually going to be regulatory frameworks that potentially treat CBDCs as crypto assets, particularly if they're issued by foreign central banks? And what does that mean uh, in a world where global banks in particular are trying to store many of these things on their balance sheet, make them available to consumers, facilitate cross-border trade and payments, et cetera. So I think as much as we're thinking about the regulation of crypto assets, 
Um, and as much as CBDCs are, well, they're fiat, they're issued by central banks, but we'll treat them as such. I think there is still a question of how exactly you treat a CBDC, particularly an offshore CBDC, particularly for balance sheet purposes, in ways that enable some of those positive use cases that we want to see emerge. Mm, that makes perfect sense. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and I'm going to come back to that financial inclusion point in a bit, because I think that's 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 relevant, particularly around kind of consumer protection as well, right? That's the other kind of side of that coin. So um, I was going to bring in Stephen, Stephen Cork now. Um, he's director of digital at Boston Consulting Group. Uh, Stephen's one of the kind of topic leads on crypto assets and DLT for BCG. Eight years of experience, authored numerous books on DLT and the future of money. And Stephen, I kind of want to go back to, to brass tacks really here. You know, we're talking about crypto, how to regulate it in future. I guess there's still a question about what is it that appeals. So for you, what, what's still driving the value and adoption of particularly Bitcoin um, today? And do you see limits to the success of, of Bitcoin? Do you see something replacing it? And, 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 you know, where's your kind of sort of brass tacks on that and why this is still appealing, not just to now increasingly institutional investors, but the many, many people who are on Twitter last week complaining that it all gone a bit wrong? Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Um, pr probably when talking about adoption of Bitcoin is worth maybe thinking about three lenses. I think one is the last one you mentioned, which is investor speculation, pure and simple. And I think that there's not a lot of worth in investigating that too much. You know, it's a, it's a volatile asset. Um, it is without a lot of regulatory protections, which allow for all sorts of practices that, you know, wouldn't be allowed in other assets. Um, so therefore that is what it is, you know, it is, you know, you know, and it's potentially a problem. I think the, the interesting thing about Bitcoin specifically is that it's growing value and in, in volume in a way that is becoming appealing to institutional investors for mostly for exposure purposes initially. But if you think about more strategically, and this is the hypothesis that my running hypothesis and what I have discussions with clients about is that how to, is thinking about how does this play out? Basically, what are the what are the things you need to start getting used to? And what are the functionalities and what are the use cases you need to start getting used to, used to as the adoption of digital assets evolve? And therefore a high liquid, you know, a relatively high liquid asset with relatively high adoption like Bitcoin is a good place to start. You know, there's no shortage of companies that are also starting to offer, you know, ser institutional services like, you know, Akin, custodianship and prime brokerage. You know, in a, in this space, which are actually validating, actually providing you the, you the further maturity to the usage of of Bitcoin. But I think that the narrative is different. The narrative is more linked to your question to Matthew, which is ultimately this evolves into other digital assets. Mm. This evolves into the use of more complex um, and nuanced ways to custody custody value and manage value. And I think first you need to get used to. The convergence, the use case convergence is simple. Ultimately, you want to win the game whereby as a customer, you're using some sort of wallet solution and therefore you want to own it. Because if you don't own the, the wallet, let's say if you're a bank, you don't own the wallet, you don't own the custodianship of the assets. If you have a central bank digital currency, you, have, you don't have a claim on the asset, therefore you cannot lend against it. Mm. So it, I think for me, that that is the important part of, out of this. Now. Is Bitcoin the, the, the currency that will play this out? I don't know, probably not. For, you know, especially if you think about like the concerns around, you know, current in its current shape and form, energy usage, consumption, and all that good stuff. You know, it, but it can change and it can still be rain and asset that we have to fork out. Uh, but probably the end game is around institutional broader option of digital assets and you know, start playing in the sandbox and getting used to it. Start playing in the sandbox and getting used to it. It's quite a, a nice phrase. It's a shame the Khalifa review wasn't just titled yeah. that. Um, I can just remind everybody, the panelists and stuff, you can still ping questions to me um, via the Q&A, but I'm going to sort of abuse my position as chair a little bit. Um, actually, just ask a question to Karen and Diego. Karen first. Um, you talked about regulators working together. It makes perfect sense. Um, we're seeing a trend, I think, in the past few years, particularly in politics and particularly amongst sort of, you know, what you might want to describe as, you know, the West in, in, in inverted commas, around global action on what you might call global developments, I suppose. So I'm thinking about 
we've got a corporate tax plan. There are clearly plans within the EU around digital taxation, how you take on Silicon Valley, so to speak. You know, do you think there's a world in which, as much as we're talking about the UK and Switzerland being global leaders in this, but that actually we end up with a sort of global standard from which, um, which firms, you know, from which crypto assets develop? Um, and I'll, I'll ask the same question to Diego after you've after you've had your your shot. Yes, I, I clearly see a tendency uh, for globalization, so to say, in the in the crypto market. As, a, as an example, uh, like we have the FATF um, guidelines or the FATF recommendations, and they um, they, they really emphasize on, on, on crypto and uh, digital assets or so-called virtual assets, as they name it. And there you can definitely see that everything will be standardized, so to say, and a lot of um, countries that are um, members of the FATF group, they apply apply more or less the recommendation one to one into their um, their like uh, legislation and regulation as well so from from this point of view i can clearly see a standardization of course each and every jurisdiction uh, has a has its own um, like uh, specific rules or regulation in Switzerland, we call them like the Swiss Finnish. So Switzerland usually, uh, maybe you've heard about if if uh, if we have like a new legislation or regulation, Switzerland usually or most of the time um, has very similar rules and regulations. But then we have the so-called Swiss Finnish. So I think the tendency is really to. Um, have kind of a standard, uh, which also, from my uh, point of view, makes a lot of sense because um, crypto isn't um, is really global. I mean, it, uh, crypto doesn't have any borders, right? And uh, that's why I think it makes sense. But I still think that each and every jurisdiction should also have its own rules, and uh, people should still have the opportunity to to choose the ju jurisdiction and the location as well. Yeah, sure, Diego. Is that something you would? You would I, I mean, I, I would I would very much echo some of some of those points. I fully agree that there are certain standards like anti money laundering, which is the the FATA focus, um, that that will be global is already global in a sense so so I, I would I would agree with that I think there is there is one very interesting phenomenon which is I think everybody is trying to grab um, and when I say everybody every jurisdiction is trying to hold on to their regulatory grip and be the standard setter at the moment you can see I mean the DM is the perfect example of you know the European regulators not wanting to allow something that they cannot control come into Europe. Um, because it's so far reaching and so all of a sudden it closed the borders and this is sort of where interestingly the US seemed to have been more open to get it rolling and you have a shift in, in a company changing locations. So I think um, yes I agree that there will be certain standards that will apply which is not uncommon you've got it in banking you've got the Basel standards for example in the banking industry but I, I think there is, um, especially in the context of consumer protection, conduct of business regulation, and, and what jurisdictions want, there is still, I think, competition between legislators. And I think everybody's trying to set their own rules so that they force providers to somehow establish, I mean, the, the, the EU is an interesting phenomenon here because their proposal it's very much tying providers into Europe. And they're really saying you need to be located in Europe in order to provide some of these activities, which, which clearly is a shift from a global, you know, international cross-border business model. Mm. So, so I think, um, yes, there will be standards, but I think some, some jurisdictions are, are trying to, you know, grab, hold on to the, the regulatory grip. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And of course, the, the longer any kind of, as these uh, as the regulations uh, have been different. Yeah. Someone just jump in there. I slightly lost that. Anyway. Sorry, I was just going to ask you. I interrupted you. Sorry, I was just going to ask if I could. Yeah, I was just going to ask if I could jump in on, on Diego's point because, um, you know, I think this question of international standards uh, when it comes to crypto assets. Uh, from a sort of compliance and cross-border conflict of law and, and, and sort of operational management point of view. Uh, 
I think we have to get used to the idea that's probably not going to happen uh, for all the regulatory questions that we have about crypto assets. There's, as, as, as Diego said, there's still going to be quite a bit of difference across markets. And so what that means is, and I think what we're, what we're trying to encourage is a focus not so much on uh, standardized line-by-line -line equivalent treatment across markets, but some fundamental agreement on kind of the core buckets and the core risks uh, mm -hmm. between markets so that you're not necessarily looking at having line-by-line -line equivalents across how you, how you regulate an exchange and peer-to-peer -peer and how you regulate all these things. But, but you do fundamentally agree on what's a CBDC versus what's a stable coin versus what's a cryptocurrency versus what's a utility token. So that you don't have a case where a digital, you know, a digital dollar is treated as, as, as a crypto asset in one market, a CBDC in another, whether that's for balance sheet purposes or other compliance purposes. Um, and the other thing, you know, the other thing that's really important to think about here is, is agreeing on those sort of fundamental core buckets is really important to, to agree supervisory approaches. And that's where you get that's where you get the pushback against regulatory arbitrage, uh, which also helps to enable this cross-border business. So, you know, we're waiting for gold credential standards from the from the BCBS. We're going to see what they're going to do next later this summer. It's not clear that they're going to go all the way towards standards. Um, but in the interim, sort of some agreement on, 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 on the core buckets of crypto assets, what they are and how they should be treated from a risk-based uh, point of view, I think would be really, really helpful. Anyway, sorry to grab the mic on that one, but I, but I, I just wanted to jump in with that practical point. This is uh, one of the, the delights of, um, of virtual versus physical. You, you really would have been able to grab the mic had we all been together. But alas, I suppose if there's any topic that lends itself to a digital discussion, it's this one. Um, Stephen, I wanted to ask you a quick question and then, and then actually get Matthew's kind of thoughts on it as well. Um, it, it's, it's sort of easy for politicians, central banks, regulators to say, you know, start playing in the sandbox um, when things are going well. And it's less easy for them to say that and to take, you know, not necessarily a laissez-faire approach, but, you know, to start thinking about what the future of crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, et cetera, might look like. When we see the kind of volatility we've seen over the last couple of weeks, when inevitably, because this is a tradable asset in some form, um, some people get burnt. Now, do you think that, you know, the volatility that is created makes it more likely that actually the balance will tip a lot more towards consumer protection rather than towards innovation, excitement, building new industries. What's your feeling on that, Stephen? Um, it, it's probably, it probably has to be a bit of, it's not going to be a pendulum. It's probably going to be balanced, right? And I think the, you know, thinking about, you know, you know the good explanation of the current share around how you know Switzerland splits you know the, the, the types of currencies if you look at how the Citizens Exchange Commission looks at it. I think there's a big big fork around is it is it essentially something that looks like a currency or is it essentially something that looks like a derivative? Mm. Right. And I think that that is where this becomes difficult because they both converge in the same that they wallet from a user perspective. Um, so that, therefore, you're going to have to have a bias towards consumer protection, you know, uh, you know, uh, inevitably. But probably it won't be as complicated as one might imagine, because today you have the same thing, and, and today you don't, you don't have a bartering system, you know, between like you know having holding equities and trading as equities. But you will have in this case. Um, th there's a real. You know, there's a real future where all this is a very complicated thing that ends up in an app, with someone has, having like you know four or five stores of value plus some Roblox coins plus some Fortnite coins plus you know, all sorts of other digital stores of value, and I think if that is the case, this becomes very difficult because you're going to have a lot of convergence of different regulatory intents. You know, consumer protection, payments, you know, securities, etc., having to govern something that is essentially rather simple. To use and potentially increase a lot of confusion. I think the balance is centered on coordination, not just around transnational regulations, but around regulatory purviews and remits. Um, unfortunately, it's not an easy answer. Um, <laughs> that's why we're not elected. That's why they. That's why they get elected, and why regulators um, have to sit there and answer to their their their, their boss class. Um, Matthew, what's your take on that? You know, you worked in policy roles in government, you must understand the politics of this makes, you know, does complicate, you know, what might be a perfect solution. Um, you know, what do you think politicians will move towards a sort of good rather than perfect? Or do you think they'll just sort of 
put it in the too hard box, which we have seen with a lot of topics over the years. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think I think the too hard box is a risk in the sense that, um, and, and I think one of the key themes that this report tries to draw out is that uh, you actually do have to do that hard work of teasing apart. Um, and the volatility and consumer protection question is very obviously in, in the headlines right now. Um, it's very obviously um, uh, you know a significant a significant issue. It is, for example, right that the UK Treasury has proposed to create a to bring crypto assets into the authorization regime around marketing, you know, so that so that there is some accountability there in terms of marketing crypto assets to consumers. Um, at the same time, the kinds of uh, and obviously we've seen from the FCA bans on certain products for retail retail consumers, crypto linked derivatives, for example. So so you know there there are steps that are already being taken to to shore that up in the UK and in other markets, um, and I think you'll continue to see that. I think the the challenge lies in calibrating the regulatory framework so that um, consumer protection uh, challenges for something like a, 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 to a tokenized solution that may be faster FX conversion in the wholesale markets, right? I mean, that's, that's not going to present the same kind of risk to consumers. Consumers aren't going to get access to that token. That's not what it's designed for. There's not going to be a secondary market for it necessarily. Um, and so calibrating the regulatory framework in a way um, that you appreciate that not all crypto assets raise those same consumer protection risks. Um, and indeed that some market participants, even for those crypto assets that do raise those risks, will be better able to handle those risks, i.e. institutional investors, et cetera, um, that, you know, that, that the regulatory framework uh, can accommodate that as it frankly does for, for traditional assets. Um, uh, none of this is to suggest this regulation is not the same as like touch regulation. It's just recognizing that certain crypto assets raise certain risks that need to be treated, perhaps backfill from a regulatory point of view, um, whereas others can be can be treated in a space. So, so you know, to, to answer your question, uh, I don't really know which way which way uh, sort of the political level will go on this, but I, I hope they recognize the opportunity and, and, and do that hard work of, of, of undertaking granular assessment and, and really calibrating the regulatory framework to the right level. Mm. No, that makes perfect sense. Um... I've got a question, a question from the panel, uh, from the, the audience has popped up, but the name has dropped off. So apologies. Um, I'm not being rude by not quoting you, but perhaps this is best for Diego. Um, you know, advising financial institutions as, as, as you do. You know, when you look at the, you know, when we talk about uh, becoming a global leader in crypto or whatever, blah, 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 blah. So much of that is, is about what's around these assets, right? It's about the legal services, the professional services, the advisory space. Um, and the question is, you know, have you noticed a change amongst those financial institutions in their understanding of crypto assets and their enthusiasm for it? Has it gone from a curiosity to a must have, I suppose? Yes, is the, is the short answer. Definitely. Um, I think five years ago, um, you would not have seen it would have you would have struggled to see magic circle firms, you know, really diving into the, the ins and outs of, of how this is regulated. But you see it now very clearly. I mean, just we all have who have contributed to, re to the reports, um, you know, have financial institution clients, and we're all very keen to, to, to work in this space. I think there is definitely a shift. And I think that shift, you can also see it in accountancy firms and consultants. There's, there's a big, there is a big push towards this industry. Um, but more importantly, I think it, it has become mainstream, I think at various degrees. So we've got, you know, some clients who have been actually looking to start you know, offering this as, a, as an asset class to their to their clients. We've got some some clients who have been thinking about it more in terms of what do I need to wh where do the risks lie? Do I have to consider doing this or not? I don't want to miss the boat type thing. So there's in in, in infancy, and then you've got clients who who have taken the view not to engage yet, but they have done the assessment already and they have thought about why they don't want to to engage, and it may be because. At the moment, they see it as, you know, reputationally too difficult or um, technologically too difficult to manage, and they, they don't want to do it. But so you've got various degrees of, of, of um, financial institution involvement, but it has certainly become something that's on the map. It's on people's minds. And I think we're going to see in the next few years a real move towards this as a, as a separate asset class, maybe not by all providers, but by some of the core providers. 
Mm, that makes perfect sense. Another question from from the audience. Thanks for, for sticking with us. Hope you're enjoying your cup of coffee or whatever. Um, is is again the name has fallen off. And did, can I just add something to that? Which uh, um, what uh, Diego said. It's a very interesting point. And um, I also consult banks and other financial intermediaries here in Switzerland. And what um, because you asked me about uh, my main takeaway, and maybe I can add something to that. In Switzerland, the banks are very um, not as open as uh, as the, actually the, the whole crypto space would uh, wish uh, wish for because the the banks are very they have a very central role in Switzerland. If you open a, a, a company, let's say a crypto company, a blockchain company, you need of course a bank account, and most of the banks here in Switzerland they wouldn't open a, a bank account if there is some somewhere written blockchain or crypto in your uh, whatever in your purpose of, of your company or or even in your name. So I think one of the takeaways is for sure banks. Um, should be more open towards crypto companies and open at least a bank account for them, like a company's bank account, not necessarily a crypto wallet, uh, but this is like too much <laughs> to ask for, but at least a company's account so that they can pay bills, salaries, and so on. I muted myself. Um, that's an interesting kind of consumer adoption space as well, which, you know, again, that could be the, the sort of the flip side of, regulation around consumer protection beyond just the marketing as Matthew alluded to you know sort of the, the, the again not a pendulum but just trying to find that that balance and um, Steve another question from from the audience uh, which I you alluded to it earlier actually so maybe that's the genesis of this question but uh, and it makes perfect sense to me one of the things that I've seen in the city over the past two years um, is ESG phrase we're all familiar with now, environmental, social and governance, um, becoming a massive concern of, of institutional investors, banks, the hairdresser down here, everybody is talking about ESG in the city. Um, and there are serious, as we've obviously seen, you know, brought into the headlines through Elon Musk and stuff, there are environmental in particular concerns around Bitcoin. There are probably some S and some G concerns as well, but particularly with Bitcoin and the E concern, do you see a world in which you know, crypto assets, cryptocurrencies as a whole, and they don't necessarily work together in this way, but are going to have to start telling a better environmental story and indeed maybe just doing it a bit better environmentally. Yeah. So probably, yes. Um, I think that's probably, that's also one of the reasons why also a couple of years ago, you know, Matthew made a comment, you know, people talking about digital assets rather than crypto assets because the crypto part of it, you know, implies a method of validation which is taxing, right? And um, and it's a concern, right? And, and that's why you know the, this hypothesis around Bitcoin, Ethereum, all this stuff, you know, in their current form, they are more a sandbox when it comes to vehicles of payments or sources of value than anything else. And probably that's don't forget that they look big, but in the grand scheme of things, there's it's still a very small asset pool, right? So for it to scale and grow in its current shape or form, they're impractical. So, and I think that the ESG concern is very valid. You know, and you know, it's a, it, I think it, that it, it shows the tip of the iceberg around how, you know, how unscalable this thing is, no matter how big it is. I you know, in the, in the grand scale of things, it cannot support any sort of value exchange context globally. So, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it is a valid concern. Yeah, and the last the last question from from the the audience, um, which I'll ask each of you, and some of you have more skin in the game on this question than than others, perhaps. And we'll start with Diego, then Karen, then Matthew, then Stephen. Is how likely do you think it is a scale of one to ten? This is the question. How likely is on the scale of one to ten that in ten years' time the UK will have a functioning regulatory environment for crypto assets and cryptocurrency? and that the UK will be a world leader in crypto assets and cryptocurrency. So Diego, you can have that one first out of 10. I am entirely confident, I would say 10. Uh, in 10 years time, we will have a regime, it will be working. Um, whether we'll be a, a world leader is, is, is harder to tell. I'm sure we will be up there with the, glo with the global leaders. Um, so, so I think, yes, 10 probably. 10, follow that Karen. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm also very confident. I would say 10. I would say um, the UK will be one of the top five. I'm very confident that uh, that it's possible to, yeah, that uh, the UK is actually um, able to do that and to have a solid uh, regulation. I mean, there are many advantages already uh, in the UK and um, the UK or London is also uh, a financial center as it's Zurich in Switzerland. So I, I really see similarities there and or or like Singapore, so 10, definitely, yeah. Matthew? Yeah, unfortunately, I totally agree. Uh, so, so no controversy here. I think there's, I think, you know, the, the, the signals from, from UK regulators are, are very positive here. There's, um, and, and um, you know, the Treasury consultation earlier this year was a pretty good example of that kind of granularity I've been banging on types of crypto assets, i.e. stable coins, and proposed a way to, to address those. Um, I think there's still you know work to be done to get this or the calibration of that exactly right. But obviously the, the political intent I think I think is pretty clear. So I'm quite confident. This has all gone a bit strictly come dancing, but um Stephen, last question to you. Yeah. So, so I think I have high confidence that you know in that period we're gonna have a relatively stable regulatory framework. I think when it comes to competitiveness, you know, probably the, the, the comparable is to look at the, you know, the maturity of the payment industry for large, to a large extent and the, and the banking industry generally. And they're probably, it's probably less than a 10, more like, you know, seven or eight, mostly because of how other jurisdictions are, you know, being, becoming very strong when it comes to those kinds of solutions, especially in Asia. So that's, you know, I think I fully agree with, you know, Karen and those, I think it's going to be like in the top. To the sense world leader, I don't think it will be just because that's going to be a different game altogether. It's a game of scale that UK is just too small now in its current context to play. For sure, no, that makes perfect sense. And thanks for uh, thanks for playing that game. I've done I've done things like this where people will ever refuse to put their um put their cards on the table. So thank you, um, and thank you too to Emma for her opening and for all the work she does at the City UK on behalf of of the Square Mile and financial services across the country. I think Kate's report overview was fantastic and the report itself is obviously a tremendous piece of work. Diego, Matthew, Karen, Stephen, thanks for your contributions to the panel. Clever Chance, Freshfields, Link Matters, Santander UK and Stan Sharp Bank, of course, for their contributions to the report. And most of all to you, the audience, uh, for tuning in. I know these virtual Zoom discussions are all starting to grind us down after 14 months, but I hope we can gather in person sometime soon. So thank you all. Um, thanks again to the City UK and everybody involved in the report. And do check out all of City AM's coverage uh, on cityam.com. So that's all from us. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the morning and afternoon.